We are looking today at part two of adjustment to emancipation. In this particular section, we usually examine the whether or not the ex-enslaved left the plantation, whether they were forced from the plantation, was there really a labor shortage? I am going to be using Freedoms One, Caribbean Emancipation, Ethnicities and Nationhood by Hilary Beckles and Vereen Shepherd. And I'm also going to be using as my next source, Caribbean History for CSEC by Kevin Baldio Singh and Radhika Mahes. The questions that we would look to ask at this point in time would be, how many of the ex-enslaved actually moved? If they moved, was it a gradual movement or was it a mediate movement? Did they move because of their memories of slavery or was it because they just didn't want to work on the estates? Was it about wages or was it a negative action of the planter? Did the ex-enslave see a greater opportunity in non-plantation activities? Now, we recognize over the years, according to Beckles and Shepard, that this was an ongoing debate among historians about whether or not they actually left the plantation. If we look at the attitudes of the planters to labor after 1838, three things stand out. Incompatible goals, narrow-minded bigoted standards expressed by many of the planters, and unfounded beliefs. So let's look at the first one. Now, after emancipation in the British colonies, the whites and the blacks had different concerns. For example, the whites wanted to ensure that they had labor for their sugar plantations, while the former slaves wanted to get a good wage for any work that they did. And these two goals were not compatible. The second thing was the narrow minded, bigoted standards of some of the planters. You had a memo written in 1832 by a member of the House of Lords who had helped to bring about emancipation revealed the main worry of the British government. It says, the great problem to be solved in drawing up any plans for the emancipation of slaves in our colonies is to devise some mode of inducing them when relieved of the fear of the driver and his whip to undergo the regular and continuous labor which is indispensable to carrying on the production of sugar. It is to the imposition of a considerable tax upon land that I chiefly look for the means of enabling the planter to continue his business when emancipation has taken place. This meant that the government and the planters would try to stop the emancipated Africans from acquiring land by making it too expensive for them to buy. And this was the typical attitude that was summed up by the British historian Thomas Carlyle, who even was even more narrow-minded in his beliefs. He said that the emancipated Africans who no longer needed to work because they could eat free-growing melons, which he mistakenly called pumpkins, would ruin West Indian sugar industry. Further to that, there was the unfounded belief that the slaves, or should I say the ex-slaves or the ex-enslaved, would get up and automatically leave the plantation after 1838.
Now, the question again is general movement or exodus? Which one really and truly was it? When we examine the action of the planters, one of the first things that we will look at, we would realize that the planters did things to the ex-enslaved that would cause them to want to leave the plantation. You had a situation of eviction taking place. You had them getting up and saying, okay, but we can't pay the rents or these rents have become too high. And therefore, because these rents have become too high, we have to leave and look for somewhere else to work. You also had a situation where the planters only wanted persons full time. So the, the, the ex-enslaved could not give their duty to the plantation for at a part time type of situation. They didn't want task work at all. They wanted to ensure that they were keeping the ex-enslaved on the plantation for the whole day. Now, if you do that, it meant that in many instances, those same persons, if they had an opportunity to, to earn wages elsewhere, would not have been able to do so. So the factors that would have encouraged the ex-enslaved to leave the plantation started from the psychological desire for personal liberty and land ownership. So according to Douglas Hall, he said the movement of the ex-slaves from the estates was not a flight from the horrors of slavery. It was a protest against the inequities of early freedom. It is possible that had the ex-slaves been allowed to continue in the free use of the gardens, the house, and the grounds, and to choose their employers without reference to that accommodation, that there would have been very little movement of agricultural labor from the communities apparently established by the estates during slavery. So that brings up your insecurity of tenure on the estate. That also brings in the high rent on the estate houses. It also looks at the low wages, okay? Now, the, now many of the ex-slaves had a familiarity with agriculture because that's all they knew. And many of them, if they could find a plot of land, they would be willing to leave the plantation and go and work that plot of land, which basically would have developed peasant trees later down. You also had a situation where in some of the colonies like Trinidad and British Guiana, Jamaica, you had availability of land for cultivation. And as a result of that, the ex-enslaved seeing that recognized that, hey, I can make a living on my own. Let me go and squat on this land and basically use it for cultivation. The landowners recognized this. The landowners decided they had to find some ways or means of keeping these ex-enslaved on the plantations. So they employed what became known as coercive strategies. One of the first strategies that they used would have been the magistrates and police as agents of labor discipline. So that basically meant that if you were supposed to work, if as an ex-enslaved, you were supposed to work on the plantation at X and Y time, and you did not report for work, then the magistrate or the police were sent to you and they could imprison you for a period of time. So that was one of the coercive strategies that was used. The other one is using the schools and the churches and the missionaries to get them to believe that working on the plantation was the right thing to do. Working on the plantation was humble work. Working on the plantation maintained social order. Working on the plantation promoted an obedience to authority. So if the churches and if the schools put this into the psyche of the Africans, many of them 
they believed would want to remain on the estate. Before we talked about the fact that the landowners refuse to allow for labor to be a whole day. So this third strategy here says the landowners refuse to do task work. Remember from apprenticeship, task work meant that you were just doing a task and you were not, you were then leaving the estate and you could go to another plantation and you could do a task there too. And you would have gotten paid. Let's say you were able to do that task in an hour. You would be able to get paid for at least, and you move from one plantation to the next, you would have been able to get paid for at least four tasks in one day. But the landowners did not want that. They tried their best to limit the economic power and the saving power, the earning power of many of the ex-enslaved. Before we talked about the fact that the landowners refuse to allow for labor to be a whole day. So this third strategy here says the landowners refuse to do task work. Remember from apprenticeship, task work meant that you were just doing a task. You were then leaving the estate and you could go to another plantation and you could do a task there too. And you would have gotten paid. Let's say you were able to do that task in an hour, you would be able to get paid for at least, and you move from one plantation to the next, you would have been able to get paid for at least four tasks in one day. But the landowners did not want that. They tried their best to limit the economic power and the saving power, the earning power of many of the ex-enslaved. They also went as far as charging the workers rent for tools, for pasture, for houses, for grounds. These were things that were not charged before, but they decided, you know, the one way for me to keep them or the one way for me to inevitably drive them away because something like this would have driven me away. Um, they, they then charged rent for tools. They charged the rent for the pasture. They charged the rent for the houses. They charged the rent for the grounds. They even went as far as tying house rents to the workers' wages. And if you tied house rent to the workers' wages, it meant that the worker was not seeing much of their salary when the month came. And on the other side of things, if the workers now could not pay the rent, they were evicted. And that in and of itself meant that they would have been out and about in the, in the country, not doing anything, which meant that they could have been arrested and they could have been put in jail. Another thing that came up was the whole idea of labor contracts. This was something that occurred mainly in Belize. And what happened was the worker was contracted and if they did not perform according to the terms of the contract, they were treated as common criminals and imprisoned for about three months of hard labor. Then you had a truck system. And that truck system was one in which you as the laborer would have been given some money before. And you were supposed to use that money basically to spread throughout the time that you were out to work. But what they used to do is set up trucks in different parts of the forest in Belize. And the persons would purchase stuff from there or they would place themselves in some debt for particular products. And then when they were paid, they had to then go back and pay the trucks. But obviously, if you were indebted to the truck, it meant that your pay didn't stretch very far. And in order to pay now, you had to go back and you had to sign another contract that would allow you to pay. So you were constantly in debt as a laborer. So this was one of the other things that was done in 
both Bahamas and Belize. All coercive strategies to maintain labor. The other thing is the artisans believe that they could get higher wages in town. So when we talk about the artisans, exactly who are we talking about? If we go to Beckles and Shepherd, Beckles and Shepherd said to us that among the first ex-apprentices to leave the plantation would have been the artisans. They said that skilled people like masons and carpenters, laundresses, seamstresses, cart builders, and wheelwrights believed that new opportunities and higher wages could be found in the towns. They also believed that they could look for jobs in those areas. And many workers, especially the field women, also looked to find part-time work in town and on the estates. Some of the freed people also got domestic and service jobs in town. Some became peddlers and petty traders and shopkeepers. Some of them also became higglers and hucksters in town. And the higglers and the hucksters would more or less be those who would have taken provisions from the estates and more or less sold them to the other person. So again, making a living for themselves. Last but not least for off estate opportunities was intra-Caribbean migration. Intra-Caribbean migration basically was that they wanted to leave the countries that they were in and travel to other Caribbean countries so that they would be able to get better wages. They believe that in, in countries like Trinidad, in countries like British Guiana, in countries like St. Vincent in some instances, um, they would have been able to get a better wage than they had received in the countries that they were in. So you had the intra-Caribbean migration occurring also. So labor shortage or not, they lost, they, the planters, lost the tight control of the laborers. That is something that we would have seen thus far. They didn't want to pay wages. And then they also introduced mechanization so that they would have lesser amount of people on the estate that they would have to pay wages to. So was it really a situation where labor shortage existed? In many instances, one would say, no, the, the, the ex-enslaved had a choice. They could now leave and they would have stayed if the wages that were paid were adequate enough. So they introduced a system in some countries of metayage or sharecropping. Metayage is a French word meaning sharecropping. This is something that was done in the French colonies, but it was also done in countries such as Tobago and the British Virgin Islands. It was done in Bahamas. So these persons introduced a system of sharecropping. Basically, sharecropping meant that the planter would give the land, the laborer would grow the cane, the planter would supply the manure, the stock, the machines, the worker would clear the land, they would plant, they would reap the crops. The estate owners then would take the crop and they would go through the process of manufacturing and marketing of the sugar. What would also happen is that the, the worker would receive a percentage of that sugar that was produced. Whatever money came from it, they would be able to get. Now, the problem there, though, is the contracts were vague and the planters also looked to undermine the ex-enslaved. So why use it, though? You had a loss of the protected market for sugar in Europe between 1848 and 54. Remember, I mentioned to you about the Sugar Equalization Act. The Sugar Equalization Act of 1846 would have removed the preferential treatment that the Caribbean planters would have had on the market. And as a part of that, you had a fall in sugar prices. 
between 1848 and 1854. The planters then also recognized that they would have to abandon their estates and in abandoning their estates, they would lose social status. The planters also recognized that because of this loss of protecting market under the Sugar Duties Act of 1846, that introducing metayage would cause them to solve cash flow problems. But the other thing that they recognized was they could delay the expansion of the peasantry. So in doing this, implementing metayage would have been a good thing. What were the benefits of the metayage? Now I'm going to give you the benefits of the metayage mostly from the freed people's side. They could stop using immigration to solve their economic problems. They could not be evicted from their land because it was an exchange that was taking place. They could maintain their house and their provision grounds. That is something that would not have been taken from, it, from them because, again, it was an exchange. They would be able to secure employment and they would avoid production risk and guaranteed market a guaranteed market for sugar. So you would have had a situation where the whole system of metayage would have benefited the freed people. What were the results of the metayage? You had sugar production increasing. You had stable crops growing. You actually had exports occurring. But the disadvantage of this was that the planters were not always honest and many of the workers did not get a chance to work their provision grounds. As a result of that, many of them accumulated debt. So the ex-enslaved accumulated debt and some of the planters accumulated debt. So that brings us to the end of our second session with regards to the adjustment to emancipation. Did the ex-slaves leave the estate because they were forced off, because they had no other choice? Was it a mass movement or was it a case where they had to leave the estate for their own survival?